What's up, everybody? This is Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect. It is a new day and another shot at the title. Unfortunately, today, we have less than encouraging news to talk about. This being related to the new Giannis biography that's about to drop. And some of the stories coming out about it involve, hey, new Mavericks coach and former Giannis coach with the Bucks, Jason Kidd. Great, what are the stories? Oh, no. None of this sounds good. I'm not surprised, to be clear, I'm not surprised that Jason Kidd has an old school coaching mentality, but it doesn't really work in today's game. And you could perhaps look at his mixed results, shall we say, not encouraging results with Brooklyn and Milwaukee as examples of it not working. Now, keep in mind, these stories obviously being when Kidd was the coach in Milwaukee. He's He's been with the Lakers the past couple of years as an assistant. He's had some time to reflect. We've found out since then he's kind of, uh, after it didn't work out there, he went and sought advice from Rick Carlisle and Greg Popovich. So he is being self-reflective in that way. But man, oh man, if he's bringing any sort of these similar elements, whether or not they're just ingrained in who he is as a coach and even as a person, then you're going to have some problems here because one of the phrases that gets thrown around by a source in this book is essentially psychological warfare when describing how Jason Kidd kind of not not just coached his players, but even like his staff, like how he treated them. Everything was like th these mind games and psychological warfare. And Kidd, when he was talking the other day with uh, 105.3 The Fan, pretty much, I think he basically tried to phrase it as like, oh, it wasn't that it was mind games so much as mind training. Yeah, okay, it's mind games, dude. You can, you can cutesy up the phrase if you want, but it's mind, it's mind games. That's what you're doing. It's psychological warfare. Now, examples of this include a January game in Philadelphia wherein the Bucks had a play. They blew a defensive assignment. Kid assumed that it was Giannis who was in the wrong, that he had made the mistake. So in a timeout, he talks to Giannis about it, and Giannis says, no, coach, I, it wasn't my mistake on the, on the assignment. Kid, not believing Giannis, continued to push. Giannis trying to stay, and this is, again, the, the book's my source here, so Giannis continues to kind of stay diplomatic about it. Like, I promise you, coach, that was not my mistake on the assignment. At halftime, Kid basically hands Giannis the iPad and says, show me it wasn't your mistake. Giannis shows him it was not his mistake. Kid, having now made such an extended blow up of this, whether on the side, uh, on the sideline, not sideline, whether next to the court, uh, in the huddle or in the locker room, basically realizes like, oh, I look like a jackass now. I need to not say face, but at the very least show that I'm still in control here, like assert myself in this situation. And so what does he do? Well, the Bucks are blowing out the 76ers. He sits Giannis for the entire second half, even though he was proven to be wrong. And even though Giannis, by the book's account, did not try to show him up or disrespect him or challenge him in any way other than to just say, coach, I did exactly what I was asked to do and I did my job correctly. That's not good. That's not good. That's not a great look. I'm not especially worried about that. Like you look at that and you say like, okay, there's a little bit of power tripping going on there, but it's nothing crazy, right? It's nothing too bad. You also have other weird instances such as a a group text regarding with all the players regarding how the team communicated and Thon Maker not having an iPhone. Ergo, when a group text went out with an updated practice time, Thon Maker did not get the message. And so Kid, pissed that Maker missed practice or was late to practice, made the entire team other than Thon Maker run sprints because somehow it affected the team's unity i okay so yeah thon maker not having an iphone to be able to be as present in the group chat and get an update 
that was the problem. And that was worth running everybody but Thawne for. Like, it's a dumb thing to run someone for anyway. I mean, how many, how do you not have better checks in place, checks and balances in place to make sure that everybody got the memo about the updated practice time? It, it's dumb anyway. So that, that's just a weird story. I don't, it's again, it's one of those things you kind of look at like, huh. And you'll notice that's a bit of a trend in these stories with Jason Kidd is that his mentality isn't just old school hard ass. He wants to effectively humiliate you. He wants to go at you, attack your very manhood in some instances. And if a guy messes up, it would be incredibly typical for him to run the entire team until they practically dropped other than that player. And I've, and I've experienced this as a player too, where if you're shooting a free throw, like this was a thing we used to do at the end of practices when I was in hell, maybe freshman in high school, where you'd line up everyone on the baseline and you'd go down the line. One person would shoot a free throw. If they made it, you didn't have to run. If you missed, everybody had to run. And inevitably, what this would do would put pressure on you to make the free throw, yes. But it also would make the, the guys on the baseline get kind of irritated with you. Like, if, the, if you were going up to the, the line and you weren't a good free throw shooter, they were already grumbling and pissed off at you. And if two or three guys in a row missed, everybody hated you. Because you miss, they got to run down, at the very least, baseline back, opposite baseline back. Sometimes it would be a full suicide where it would be free throw back, half court back, other free throw back, full court back. And of course, there was always a timed element to it as well. So if you didn't go fast enough, you had to run again. So yeah, fun. That's, that's the kind of thing that you might see in these stories. But in some cases, they go to incredible extremes. You have situations here where this is from uh, Nixon Dorvillen, who was a, a Bucks assistant trainer from 2014 to 2016. He basically says of Jason, Jason had a brilliant mind, but he kind of made you uncomfortable around him. He basically, uh, this is then another source here talking about it, uh, talking about Kid as a coach, says, I don't want to sound negative, but some of Kid's methods would be to embarrass the culprit of an error by making everyone but that person run sprints for his mistake. He just had a way of getting his point across. So that's what I was just kind of detailing there. Very uh, troubling stuff. Now, Kid, he effectively, when he finished up as a player, went and was the coach at the Brooklyn Nets. But when that wasn't, he didn't like how some of the front office was kind of running. It wasn't in line with what he wanted to do in terms of basketball decisions. He effectively attempted a, a bit of a power coup. It didn't work, but it was fine because he had a backup plan because he knew a bunch of people in the front office in Milwaukee from his time in New York. And so he was able to essentially orchestrate a rare coach trade, not where coaches trade, but as part of a trade, a head coach is involved. And so he stepped in with Milwaukee. But the thing is, he never had to face repercussions for what happened in Brooklyn. He just decided like, all right, if I can get control here, like I want, then no harm done. I got what I want. And if I don't, it's fine. I got a backup plan and their front office just sucks anyway, because they don't see things the way I do. So he never had to face up for it. And I think he kind of just has this little bit of unhinged old school nature about him. He doesn't just want to run his players hard. He wants to basically drill sergeant the entire process, try to break them mentally because he thinks that's how you make players tougher. You have to push them and push them and push them to the point where they either break and if they weren't good enough to deal with it anyway, then they, they're done. And that was what was seen with Larry Sanders. Larry Sanders on the Bucks uh, was, I guess, the, the whipping boy for Jason Kidd in many of these instances where Kidd basically relentlessly, ruthlessly hounded Larry Sanders and basically broke him to the point where Sanders just completely stepped away from basketball. Just completely, mid-season, December 23rd, just basically retired on the spot because of how Kidd was treating him. You know, you might look at that and say, like, 
oh, well, he just wasn't tough enough to deal with it. But it, it's one of those things, too, where if you have a coach and he's literally getting guys, like, forcing them into retirement, he's inflicting such trauma on them to the point where I, I think uh, he's running them down to the point where they're nearly hospitalized and just completely uh, humiliating them, breaking them down, calling them absolute garbage and trash. It, it's not... It's not okay, and it's not going to be well-received in the game today. People might look at that and say, like, the leagues are soft now. First of all, the people saying this are people who can't play in the league anyway, so they have no reason to judge, no room to judge. Second of all, just because something was done a certain way in the past doesn't mean that that's the way that it should be done now. You not, you're not going to see in really any league, other than extreme examples, yes, you can find a Bill Belichick or a Nick Saban. Yes, those are two examples in football, at the very height, the very peak of success, multiple titles. And so you might look at that and say, hey, that shows that their methodology works. But I promise you, the moment those guys aren't winning titles, that shit won't fly. It won't. If Belichick doesn't find his new quarterback soon and they miss the playoffs the next couple of years, presumably, he's going to find his relationship in New England very strained and they're going to look for a new direction. That's inevitable. With Saban and Alabama, they've been, man, they've been built for a while to be able to just be this prolonged dynasty, basically, the last decade plus. So maybe it's a, not as clear of a finish line there. But I'm telling you, man, if they're not winning, as Saban, he got his one national title with LSU, and you know he came to the pros with the Dolphins one year, and he couldn't go anywhere. And that messaging where is incredibly thin if you can't produce the absolute height of success so all things to consider there in the new nba you're not going to be able to do that you're not going to be able to come in here and this is where i'm concerned for the mavericks sense with jason kidd yes it's great that he talked to carlisle yes it's great that he talked to popovich to try and understand and learn and grow from what he where he went wrong but if we're trying to talk about somebody that can salvage KP that can deal with KP and help him reach his full potential and deal, you know, one of the things we talked about with KP a lot in recent streams and recent shows and all of that is if he's physically and mentally right, he is unguardable. Well, here's the thing, man. If you're having to, if you're having to consider whether or not Jason Kidd based on these stories is the right guy to have KP right mentally, Mmm, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement. It really doesn't. I can easily see this being a litmus test for their future with KP. If Kid is going to try and be anything like this, it's not going to work. Now, I mentioned earlier, not only has this been a while since, not only did Kid finally by getting fired by Milwaukee and then having a little bit of a hiatus before joining the Lakers as an assistant, not only did he have to kind of reevaluate things and grow, he finally had to see punishment effectively that he didn't have to see going from Brooklyn to Milwaukee. And so maybe that made him rethink things a little bit. And he even acknowledged in this round, this go around as a head coach again, one of the things he tried to take was perspective in that regard to not just enjoy the process a little bit more but also understand he had to cede some of that control and it wasn't just on the floor it's also how he was there one of the things in this book as well talks about how a couple days before the bucks were going to have their christmas break effectively uh a couple days before christmas eve he essentially the bucks dropped the game they should have won they feel they should have won after the game in the locker room, Kid basically asks, um, I think it was Zaza Pachulia, whether he thinks that the team deserves a two-day break. Pachulia, kind of like, ooh, that's an awkward spot to put me in, tries to kind of walk that line of like, yeah, coach, you know, we understand we didn't play as well as we should have today. We should have won this game, but it is the Christmas break. It's important that everyone gets to spend time with their family and all of that. Kid, without acknowledging that statement, turns to, I think, Jared Dudley, asks the same question, who he tries to give the same answer. Then at that point, Kid basically says, we didn't play good enough. We played like shit. 
We didn't play good enough to deserve two days off. So we're going to be back here for practice 9 a.m. The whole team is up in arms at this point because they've got flights booked. A lot of these guys are leaving the country even for some of uh, these family visits and plans. And Kid basically says, I don't care. You get paid to do this. You're going to do it because you're not living up to the standard. Practice the next day, 9 a.m., basically runs the team into the ground. It's not even about like, hey, let's get here and let's try to work on the things we did wrong. It's no, it's more like, I want to break you. So not only am I going to... Now, this was Christmas Eve, or early in the morning Christmas Eve. So they were Christmas Day and Christmas Eve night with their family. But it's still an effort to break these guys down where... It's not enough just to come in here and show like, hey, I'm not just upending your plans. I'm going to literally punish you on top of everything. That's, that's not comforting. That's not something that's going to work at this stage. He's ha he has to have learned from that because if he didn't, then he's not going to be long cut out, even in Dallas where he brought a title where he was drafted number two overall originally in 94. He's not going to be able to deal with all of that, to overcome that. Because, say what you want, man, if he coaches like that, and Luca's been coached hard, he has. But some of this stuff that you're hearing from Kid is north of even Carlisle on the hard-ass meter. And that is not good. If Kid is anything like Carlisle, who Luca clashed with at times, sometimes privately, sometimes not so privately, then that does not bode well for his tenure in Dallas. I do look at this and I acknowledge, like, hey, when Giannis won a title, he acknowledged Jason Kidd, basically crediting him in part for his development. And now Kidd is who told him not to shoot when Giannis was a reasonably good shooter at one point early in his career. But... Kid put that emphasis on him defensively. He put that emphasis on him in terms of uh, developing other aspects of his game as well. And that's what Giannis was crediting, that work ethic and working in those other facets of his game. Great. When the Lakers lost Kid to Dallas as an assistant, LeBron James commented basically saying, ah, oh, man, I can't believe we're losing you. Like, I'm happy for you, but this, you know, it sucks to lose you as a coach. Damian Lillard, now he's never played for Kidd, but he really wanted that to be, Kidd to be the new coach in Portland. You have these guys who are superstars and who have played for Kidd or want to play for Kidd and are enthusiastic about it. Now, they all seem to be giving a vote of confidence. I would assume, obviously, with LA, Kidd as an assistant wouldn't have that same that same authority to make these kind of decisions to be the kind of coach that we're hearing about in these stories from Milwaukee. And so I'm basically going to boil it down to this. Assuming kid has grown from this and learned from this, it can be a problem, but I don't think it necessarily has to be. I'm willing to believe that he's had to do some forced introspection that he finally had to kind of see consequences to his actions and how he conducted himself and kind of just understood that, you know, we can't, we can't do this. We can't rely on this kind of old school mentality because it doesn't work. Ask Rick Carlisle why it, didn't, why it didn't work in Dallas ultimately 10 years after they won a title. Carlisle was a hard ass in 2011. He was. I'm reading the book again right now, This Year is Different by Bob Sturm, which is literally all about the Mavericks' journey basically from the start of the franchise until they won the title in 2011. And it focuses predominantly, as you might guess from the title, on the championship season. But Carlisle was a hard ass. He was. But 10 years later removed, he had to continually tone down different aspects of his coaching style and of his mentality because it doesn't resonate anymore. It starts to fall on deaf ears and you start to lose a locker room. And that's what happened with Kid in Milwaukee. He lost the locker room. Now, Giannis was devastated when Kid got fired midseason. That was, that was something that we heard about. And it was one of the things people speculated on for two years why Giannis might have left the Bucks ultimately because he was devastated at the loss of Kid. Giannis did like him. 
But I think Giannis is an exception where you can have someone who you break and then they form better. What happened to my backdrop? Wait for it. There we are. And in that regard, um, that, that was a concern for them. Just because you have some guys who can endure it and reach new heights, like Giannis, for instance, doesn't mean that that's going to work with role players. It doesn't mean that's going to work with every superstar, frankly. I don't know. But kids' mind games, if you will, that approach, it's a dangerous, slippery slope. Because it might work for some guys and it's not going to work for others. Kid doesn't sound like he takes one approach with one guy and a different approach with others. To him, it's black and white. It's this is how we do it. This is how we're not going to do it. It's not, hey, with this guy, I got to give him a pat on the back and tell him like, oh, it's going to be all right. You know, you're struggling a little bit right now, but I believe in you. We'll work through this. No, it's do your job. Do it right. This is what I'm telling you to do. Do it. It's that mentality. He's not going to fine-tune and personalize, customize his approach with different players. But the thing is, players respond differently. What works for one guy, in this case, what worked for Giannis, did not work clearly for other guys in the locker room, such as Larry Sanders. So you have to make that distinction. You have to figure that out. And if Kid can't show that he's grown in that regard, then... I have questions about how long he'll last in Dallas because I've I've talked about this recently, why I've been saying they should hope they can land Tyson Chandler because yes, Tyson's old school as well and he's absolute accountability as well. But I think Tyson showed with a certain presence and charisma throughout that title year, how he was able to bring the locker room together and help it reach new heights. And that was case in point when Tyson was out for a period uh with illness that season just a few games uh dealing with like a a flu and it was just during a really condensed part of the schedule the team looked like it had no will and no effort it didn't have any fire or pride in itself and as soon as he came back turned back on a dime and suddenly they started playing like them their old selves again that's the kind of presence and charisma you need someone that can rally the troops But if you have a coach that can't bring people together, yes, he can bring the absolute cream of the crop to their potential, but he can't bring along the guys that have to work within that system as well, the role players and such, then you're going to have a difficult difficult, uh, time succeeding and taking that next step as a franchise. Because, yeah, this team has to get over the hump. Tyson has shown that he could be the missing piece to do it. Kid was here for two full years before Tyson got, well, I guess a year and a half, before Tyson got here. And Dallas was still first round exits in both of those seasons. 08, his half year here, they got beat in five by Tyson, Paul, and the Hornets. Nine, they beat the Spurs in the first round and then got their asses beat by Carmelo and Chauncey Billups and the Nuggets in the second round. And then they had another year losing to the um, Spurs in the first round. So fine. In that situation, he wasn't able to get them. He got them out of the first round once. He wasn't able to get them beyond that to actually reach their potential. And it took someone like Tyson that could bring everything together. Kids invaluable as a, as a player, as a court general, all of that was invaluable to that team. But there's something about leadership that goes beyond that. That's all I'm talking about here. Let me know in the comments. What do you think? Have I prattled on too long about this story? Is this making a mountain out of a molehill or are these genuine red flags that you think are legitimate concerns about Kidd and whether or not he can work as a head coach in Dallas or anywhere. Let me know. That's all my time for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.